about you, but I'm not really very good at prayer. I'll just tell you, as a pastor, I've been trying to be good at prayer for a long time, and I'm, I'm better than I, than I used to be. Am, am I the only one? Am I the only one? No, I'm not the only one. Good, 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 good. I'm glad I'm with, with a company here that'd be compassionate with me, but I, I'm just really not that good at prayer, but I am getting better. And so Jesus taught us not only how to live, he actually taught us how to pray. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in this series because because we at Overflow Church, we value presence. Come on, every time we gather and everywhere we go, and one of the places we need to go is to the place of prayer. And some of you, you, you don't have a place of prayer because you just don't see any value in it. And there's some other obstacles in the way. But what I want to do is I want to start each episode in this series. I just want us reciting what we call the Lord's Prayer. All right, would you stand up, Matthew chapter 6? We're just going to declare this. All right, this is the last time you have to stand up for the next, you know, 40 minutes or so. Hopefully 40 minutes. So it might be 140 minutes. All right, Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. Now, we're, we're going from the, the New King James Version, which is not something we normally use, but it's a little bit, the language is a little bit more familiar, so we decided to go ahead and do that. So let's just pray this, declare this, and pray this at the same time. Ready? Go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right. You can sit down, give somebody a high five and say, man, you just prayed. You just prayed for like 40 seconds. That's awesome. That's more than what most Christians do in a day. In a day, are you tracking? So in this, where we're at, and we're in Matthew chapter 6. Now, Jesus preaches this message in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 called the Sermon on the Mount. And we focus a lot on the Sermon on the Mount, right? Because the Sermon on the Mount teaches us what kingdom living is all about. You want to know how to live in the kingdom? You want to know what it looks like to be a son or a daughter of God? Then you need to get in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 because Jesus is preaching the greatest sermon that's ever been preached. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. He stands up on this mountain. He preaches, and all these people are listening. And in the middle, the meat is in the middle. It's like this sandwich sermon, and the meat is in the middle. And the meat is what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Now, let me help you with something. It's not really the Lord's Prayer. John chapter 17 is the Lord's Prayer. That's when Jesus is praying. This is actually the disciples' prayer. Now, it's okay that you call it that. But understand that it's really not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer because he's teaching his disciples how to pray. Now, I'm sure he had been praying this way, but he's teaching them how to pray. So really, it's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. Now, this is a historic prayer, right? This prayer has been prayed for thousands of years, The early church prayed it. Come on. The modern church prays it. Come on. The the church that don't even know Jesus pray it. I mean, you see it on TV, people that are far from God that don't even have the slightest clue of who Jesus is. They pray the Lord's Prayer. Most people probably in America could recite the Lord's Prayer, right? But don't get simply liturgical which is what some people do. They just the liturgy. They just have something memorized and they recite it. And don't be lethargic because you already know it. But what I want to do is through this series, I want you to pray through the Lord's Prayer. So in this, Jesus is like giving us a cake called prayer. And he gives us in this what I believe are six ingredients in this prayer to help us with our prayer life. It's not, a, it's not you just pray this and then you're done. You check the box. And many do that. Many, that's all they do is what we just did a few minutes ago. They wake up. They're very religious. They pray this prayer, and then they check the box. But really, what Jesus is giving us here are the ingredients to effective prayer. How I many you know there is a difference between prayer and effective prayer? James talks about the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What does that tell us? That tells us that the unfervent, uneffectual prayer doesn't avail much. It doesn't matter much. And some of you have an ineffective prayer life, if we're just being honest. But how many of us want a more effective prayer life? And let me just suggest this to you, that if you want to have a productive prayer life, you just need to pray more. 
<laughs> so the reason why people don't have a productive prayer life is because they're looking for the product of the prayer versus the person of their prayer, which is God, the Father. Okay, so when we're looking at this, don't just pray, just don't, don't, don't just recite it, don't just declare it, pray through it. So we're giving you these bookmarks, we're giving you these, what well, we're going to talk about, prayer tips as you go through just little, little hangers for you to, to endure. Because if you're like me, sometimes you sit down and you're like, you ran out of words in like 15 seconds. Am I the only one? Right? We don't pray more because we're like, well, I just don't know what else to pray. Right? And so what I want to do is I want to help give you kind of an outline is what Jesus gives us. He gives us almost a formula. I don't know we don't like it because we're all about relationship. But relationship means I'm relating to you based upon who you are. And there are rules in relationships. There are rules in communication. Right? Okay. So Jesus starts this, this whole thing off with what is called, what we're going to call the posture of prayer. The posture of prayer. What is, what is our posture when we pray? Okay, and I, listen, let me just say from the offset, really what we're talking, because we talk, we've talked about, you know, just maintaining the thread of prayer through our day. We, we talk a lot about that, about the presence. Every time I go, we talk a lot about breath prayers. We talk about praying as we go. That's great. But what Jesus is talking about here is not necessarily the, the highlights through your day where you're just connecting with the Lord. He's not talking about, if you will, like a few text messages. He's talking about that you sit down and you have a time to talk to him. And that's where most of us lack, if we're honest, right? Because most of us would say, we're, we're pretty good. I mean, I'm really good at getting in the truck and just turning the radio off and just saying, Father, and just engaging the Lord as I'm driving. But Jesus is talking about something different here. He's talking about the discipline of prayer. And if you want to follow Jesus and do what Jesus did, then you've got to learn to develop prayer because Jesus often withdrew himself to lonely places to pray. This is something he did. So if we're following Jesus, then we got to have those secret places where we're praying. Okay? So the posture of prayer. So Jesus starts off. We're going to start in verse 9 here. Chapter 6, verse 9, he says this, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Right? We know this. Most of us miss that first part of the verse. In this manner, in this posture, in this way, this is how you're supposed to pray. So that tells us something. Some of y'all aren't going to like this. That's okay. I'm your pastor. I'm here to lead you. <laughs> there's a right way to pray, and there's a wrong way to pray. If there wasn't, then Jesus wouldn't say, in this manner, pray. He wouldn't give us a guide on prayer. He would just say, pray however you feel led. But that's not what he does. He gives us the scriptures. He, Paul shows us there's many scriptures throughout, throughout the books to the church that teach us how to pray. So right before this, Jesus is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. You okay? In verse 5, he says this, and when you pray, and he tells us some wrong ways to pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Oh, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street that they might be seen by men. Some people pray to be seen. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward, being seen. But you, here we go, a right way to pray. Go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father, who is in the secret place. And your Father, who sees in secret. You know, we're talking about cultivating. Seeds grow in the dark. Seeds grow in the hidden. Seeds grow in a secret place, and eventually they produce. This is your prayers. They're in the secret place. They're before the Father who is in secret, and then it says this, that he will reward you openly. In other words, eventually that seed will produce. But are you doing it in secret? Not just on Sundays. We love that. Corporate prayer, love it. We need it. And when you pray, here he goes again. On a don't. Do not use vain repetitions. 
as the heathen do. Heathen are lost people. Man, Jesus has some strong language. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, don't be like them. Don't pray like that. For your father knows the things you have before you ask him. So he tells us, don't pray to look spiritual like the hypocrites. Don't pray to sound spiritual like the heathens, right? And let me just say this about words. Words are important. Words are important. Language is important. In fact, we're seeing that a lot in our nation right now through social media, through all media, through relationship, words are important. And I would encourage you this. When there's tension, get off the digital communication and get on the phone and be able to hear somebody's tone. Get across from a table from them because words are important and words are often misinterpreted because words were meant to have connection to them, relationship, not on a screen. Come on, I need to hear your voice. I need to see your face. So words are important but they're not magical. And I've seen people pray this way. They think if I can say the right words, right? We even do this sometimes, and I'll get back to this in a moment. We even do this in the name of Jesus. I've had people rebuke me for when I got to the end of prayer and I didn't say in the name of Jesus, and they said, well, you didn't say the magic word is basically what they're saying. It's like God's gonna be, no, not until you say in Jesus' name. Listen, the only way I can pray is in the name of Jesus, because of Jesus. So words are not magic, magical. So when you pray, what's he telling us? Don't babble. And sometimes we, we try to sound spiritual when we pray, right? People, people sometimes get this, this kind of mode, right? Their prayer voice. Father God, I thank you, Lord in heaven. Jesus, 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 Jesus right? And what are we doing? We, we start to Babble. We just start to repeat things. Lord, Father God, Father God, Father God. When we pray, Lord, Father God, heaven, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. And what are we doing? We're just using filler words so we're not being contemplative and people will think we're unspiritual. We're doing exactly what Jesus rebukes here. Okay? I, I, listen, understand this. I'm not being critical of you because I've, I've been there. I've done that. What I would rather you do is, is be thoughtful when you're praying. It doesn't have to be fat. You're not preaching when you're praying. I always preach when I'm praying because I just always preach. And when I'm leading worship or praying or I'm talking in a conversation, I'm just always preaching. But you're not preaching when you're praying. You're just, you're talking. That's, when I'm talking, I'm preaching. But so what I'm wanting to do is I'm not, I'm, listen, none of this series, there's going to be some things that come across as critical. None of it is critical. I want to help you develop the correct posture when you pray. I want to help you to guide you into a devoted life of prayer because if you're solid and you're in the dark and you're developing those roots, come on. You'll have fruit that remains. So what is, what is his instruction here before he gets into the ingredients? His instruction is this, designate a special place and pray. And one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do during this series is really take a lot of notes. That's why we have note sheets and all that, because this is a learning series. I'll, I'll preach. It'll be okay. But uh, that I have to remind myself that it's a teaching series. I'm really trying to help you. So in this manner, therefore, pray. Now, let me help you. Luke chapter 11, verse 2, he says it this way. Same prayer, different language. When you pray, say. When you pray, say. Everybody say, say. Say. So you just said something, right? You might have thought it when I said it, but now you actually said it. So Jesus is saying, when you pray, he's saying, don't be quiet about it. Say, well, I'm just not really, hold up. See, prayer is a devoted conversation with God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is a conversation. Prayer, thoughts are not prayers, Sometimes you can pray in your thoughts, right? Sometimes you could pray in your spirit. Yes, absolutely. In fact, you should do that all the time. 
However, thinking about an issue or worrying about an issue isn't prayer. Can I tell you something? Worrying is actually sin. Because worry is meditating on fear. That's all worry is. I'm thinking about the bad possibilities. Uh, we, we served under a pastor in Amarillo who used to say this. He says, worrying really does work because 95% of the things you worry about never happen. <laughs> it actually doesn't work, but you get the point. So worry is meditating on fear. Stop meditating on fear. Stop thinking about fear and start thinking about your father. Come on. So prayer is a devoted conversation. And I would suggest this to you, and this is a prayer tip. Pray out loud. Pray out loud. When you're, it doesn't mean you have to be like real loud, right? Like the neighbors can hear. Sometimes it should get there. Come on. Sometimes you should be passionate in your prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of the Lord. Come on, that's not quiet. That's fervent. Sometimes it needs to be loud. Sometimes it needs to be quiet. Sometimes it needs to be contemplative. But when you're praying, use words. You don't have to wake everybody in the house up. Right? So when I'm praying, when I sit down in the mornings and I make my coffee and I sit down in my recliner and I light my candle and I break out the Psalms and I set them in my lap, what do I do? I start verbalizing to God. It's not real loud. But let me tell you, when you, when you pray out loud, what it does is it directs your thoughts. So everyone say white elephant. Say pink elephant. What did you visualize? A white elephant and a pink elephant. Why? Because your words direct your thoughts. We think my thoughts direct our words. Sometimes, this is why it's so important for you to say, oh, come on. It's so important for you to say the right things. Because your mouth is a leader of your heart and your thoughts. So sometimes you don't want to say the right thing. But if you will say the right thing enough, eventually, you'll have in the interior the right thing. So speak the word of God. Speak prayers. Well, I'm just not that kind of person. Well, you know, and I know that when you pray, you're super distracted. Because when I'm thinking prayers, oh, Lord, I think, about, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about that? Right, a million things. Because I can think about five million things in one minute. And if all I'm doing is thinking when I'm praying, I'm not really focused. I'm super distracted. So one of the ways, and I'm probably more than you, but one of the ways that you help your prayer life is by using words. So pray out loud. Well, uh, that doesn't mean you have to do it in a group setting. But I will tell you this, you'll be more comfortable doing it in a group setting and more fervent and more excited to do it in a group setting when you've done it in a private setting because you've practiced. You're not doing it to practice. Come on, that's the game, right? It's Listen, all the work, all the stuff that you do, you're not praying to fuel that. You're doing all that to fuel your prayer. Are you tracking? And so we've got this thing backwards. What, you know, I was taught when I came to the Lord, hey, you need to have a really good prayer life or you're not going to be fruitful. No, no, no. I want to be fruitful so that I have a good prayer life. Right? So what I do fuels my intimacy. I'm not intimate with Jesus so I can be a better Christian. I'm a better Christian so I can be more intimate with Jesus. Are you tracking? And some of you have got that wrong. You're allowing the, 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 your, your intimacy to fuel your urgency, but really your urgency is what's supposed to be fueling your intimacy. And I lived the other way for a long time. And then I started realizing what's more important than what I do is the time that I have in prayer that I'm getting before the Lord. And so the argument is made is this. And Jesus even mentions the argument. The argument is this. Well, God knows everything. God knows my thoughts. God knows my God knows how I am. Yes, he does. And Jesus actually makes reference. Your father already knows. And then he says, "Therefore pray." He knows, but he wants to talk. He wants to commune. So the listen, the purpose of prayer isn't to get an answer. It's to be with the person. And if you look at the, listen, if you judge your prayer life based upon the product, then you're always going to be disappointed. The purpose of prayer is him. He's the purpose. It's about intimacy. 
So people would say that. Well, you know, it's just not really the way. Listen, we don't pray our way. We pray God's way. I know that's very simple. Stop praying your way. Pray God's way. If it wasn't important enough, Jesus wouldn't have taught on it. So following Jesus doesn't mean that you just do some of the things he likes, that you like, but that you desire all, to follow all the instructions that he gave. You're not trying to get away with things that Jesus was clear about. And there's a lot of people that say, I like Jesus. I like all the humanitarian things that he did, but I don't really like the stuff that he, that he really talks about, like stuff like prayer. Jesus fed the poor. We need to feed the poor. You're louder about that, but Jesus also taught on prayer. When's the last time you got in the place of prayer? Well, Jesus taught on love. Yeah, absolutely. When's the last time you prayed? You're focused on the doing, less on the being. So we follow Jesus together. We're following him. We're pursuing him. So in following him, we're following all that he tells, calls, commands us to do. And I would suggest this. Everything that Jesus said was a command. None of it was a suggestion. He's the one that we're following. Now, he didn't say it in a demeaning, dictatorial, angry way. He was just saying, listen, you want to follow me? This is what it looks like. And right in the middle is this thing called prayer. And so what he does is he says, in this manner, in this posture, therefore pray. Say, our Father. Say that with me. Our Father. Our Father. Our is a collective community. It's collective. It's, it's us. It's the beloved. So when you're praying, it's, uh, what I love about God is he has this, this master plan. And some of, some of timing in our prayers is because God's got billions of people praying. Come on. And he's, and he's, connect, he's the great master planner, and he's connecting the dots of the prayers. Are you, are you tracking? So sometimes timing isn't so much about, God, why am I waiting? It's like, because I'm doing this over here and I'm positioning things to work that together for your good. So that helps us with patience when we understand that God's answering a billion prayers. Probably not quite a billion, but pretty close. And when we talk about God, us praying, it's, it's, it's his community. It's not the human community. We just want everybody, that's what, listen, that's why this whole like tolerance, kind of all religions just come, I don't go to those. We're just going to bring the Buddhists and the Muslims and the Christians. No, because we're not praying to the same God. We went uh, years ago, I went to, uh, was in an international air airport in Amsterdam, and this friend of mine and I went, Joel, and we went to this we were there in the airport. We had like a 12-hour layover. And so we saw they had a temple. They had a place where you could go and pray. And it like has a sign and everything. It's like, oh, you know, peace, coexist. How many know that doesn't work? So they have like the coexist sticker. It doesn't say coexist, but it's something, you know, all the religions. And like we, we, we start to walk up and go into this prayer room, and we're like, ooh. There was just something in our spirit that felt yucky. Why? Well, I think about what. It says in Acts, so they were praying to an unknown God. The other thing I th think is my God is not that God. There's not many ways to God. There's only one way. His name's Jesus. And if you're going to follow Jesus, that's the claim he made. That's, we pray to God through Jesus. So the Jews, understand this, up to this point, the Jews recognized God as Father, but they never addressed God as Father. So there was this research done uh, from, a, from a German uh, scholar that went through all the, the history of Jewish teaching, of uh, Jew, 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 <laughs> Jewish teaching from their, their scriptures, from other sources, all throughout the scripture, and he could not find one single time where a Jew actually referred to God as father. They recognized God as Father, but they never addressed him in that specific manner. And so what happens is Jesus shows up on the scene, and he's calling God Father. And so part of the irateness towards Jesus is because he was saying, look, I have a connection. It's intimate. I'm not just recognizing God as Father. I have a connection. I call him Father. And not only did Jesus do that, he taught his disciples to address God as Father. Whoa. This is part of the reason he got killed. He's the first rabbi that ever taught that you should do this. 
radical. So we learn this in John chapter 1. Because Jesus is the way to the Father, right? He's the way of the Father. He's the way to the Father. To those who believed in him, those who accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. We're not all God's children. All the people of the world are not God's children. He is the heavenly Father, but he's not their father. They haven't been adopted in. So you got, the thing about the kingdom of God is you got to be born again into it. This was Jesus, this is Jesus talking. Well, you don't like it? Then, then you don't like what Jesus taught. You don't like the scriptures. Reconcile your heart. What does he say? Do many as believed in him and received him, he gives them the right, exousia, governmental authority to become children of God. See, my natural children, they're mine. They have authority as my children. My brother has four adopted children. They're, they're not just his children. They're actually legally bound to be his children. They're more legit in court than my children are. And this is what happens whenever we come to the Lord. He gives us exousia, governmental authority to be his children. So we're born again into it. We're adopted. So our posture before God to call him father comes from our position, our position in Christ. We are in Christ, therefore we can approach God. Those that aren't in Christ can't approach God. They just can't get there. Until they call upon the name of the Lord, then they're rescued, they're saved. Now they have access. So our posture comes, Galatians, our posture comes from our position. Galatians chapter four, verse six, because you were sons, God sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Because why? Because we are God's sons. We are God's daughters. We are God's kids. Why does it use sons there? Because sonship talks about inheritance. The son always receives the inheritance. That's why I use it. It's not, it's not about gender. It's about position. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. You're no longer, I would suggest this, you're no longer a sinner. You're a son. Then an heir of God through Christ. How can you be a sinner and be a son of God? You can't. You're one or the other. You're not a sinner anymore. You were a sinner, but you've been saved by grace. Now you're, you have right, you have access, you have exousia, you have authority as a child of God. Therefore, you can not just recognize God as the heavenly father, you can say, Father, in an intimate way. So we pray to our father. We, we don't pray to the stars. We don't pray to the dead. We don't pray to angels. We don't pray to the fortune teller. We don't pray to the, the horoscopes. We don't pray to, the, to luck. We don't pray, pray to the lottery. We have no hope in those things. We pray to our heavenly father. We don't ask for intervention in anything else because anything else would be powerless. Anything else would be useless. Anything else would be idolatry. So we pray to our father. So this is the prayer tip. We pray to our father through Jesus led by the Holy Spirit. So when you're praying, and some people are just all, it's important for, for you to develop this grid and this understanding. We're just kind of praying, just going, hey, Jesus. And what happens is, is you have a very unfocused prayer life. I'm trying to help you get laser focused in your prayer. You're praying to the Father through Jesus because you've been adopted by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're really, I wouldn't say amiss, but, but really when we're praying, we're talking to the Father. We're not really talking to the Son. Right? We're not really, we're talking through the Son. We're not talking to the Holy Spirit. We're praying by the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit of God. So that's your prayer directed towards the Father. And that helps us with the intimacy thing because I approach God like a child. Like my kids call on me and I go and help them. Do you understand? You've got a dad in heaven. Some of you didn't have a good dad, but guess what? You got a dad in heaven and you've been adopted by the blood of Christ that you can approach him and you might've had a, a terrible human experience, but I tell you, there's a heavenly experience that goes on forever because of the price that Jesus paid. And by the spirit of God, you can approach God. You can sit in daddy's lap. You can stroke his heavenly beard. Come on, love it. 
And get this, he's in heaven. Our Father, who is in heaven. Who is in heaven. Oh, that seems like a far, far, far away. Isaiah 66, 1 says that, that heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I think, man, God's far away. But he says this, the earth is his footstool. What does that, what does that mean? That means, that means that God is just reclining <laughs> on the earth. And he sees all. He knows all. And then that's why Jesus says, your father knows before you even pray. He sees what's happening. He's longing for you to approach him. He sees what's happening. He's longing for you to approach him, to intervene. If he seems far away, if he seems inaccessible, like he's out of range, check this out, Isaiah 59.1. Listen. I love how it starts. I was telling Pastor Brooke that before service. I love how it starts. Listen. That sounds like I preach that. Listen. The Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor his ear, here it goes, to death to hear your call. His, his ear is, is bent towards those who are his. His hand is reaching. Remember Jesus? The kingdom is within hand. Now, love that verse. He's not far away. He's not unable to save. He's here to rescue. However, there is something that can block our access, beloved. There's something that can keep us from approaching God, and it's called sin. I love how the gospel is even in the Lord's Prayer. There's something that blocks our access. It's called sin. It says in the next verse, he's not too far away. And then he says this in verse 2. He says, oh, hold up. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Some of y'all aren't going to like this, but God doesn't hear the prayer of the sinner. He only hears one prayer from a sinner, those that call upon the name of the Lord. Once he hears that, full access. Full access. You say, well, no, I saw, I saw God moving in my life. It's because someone else that had access was praying for you. That's why. You see, and, and do you understand that there is a great responsibility, not for us to, to be mean-spirited. God doesn't hear the prayer of the sinner. We're not being angry like that. We're saying, listen, God doesn't hear their prayers, so I better make sure I'm praying for them because I have the access. So I better develop my prayer life because I have compassion on those people. I recognize the truth. And then I reconcile that reality with, hey, I, they can't approach God, but I can. That's why when people come to you, we, it's funny how believers will come to me and say, man, be praying for me. Like my prayers are like superpower. Prayers. Listen, you have access. And I will pray for you. I'll agree with you. And scripture talks about that. So prayer is a privilege of those made right before God. It's a privilege. It's a right that you have. Y'all okay? So our Father, come on, who is in heaven. But let me remind you, there's someone else in heaven. <laughs> come on. There is someone else in heaven. The great intercessor, the one who has walked in our shoes, the one who has struggled, the one who is tempted like we're tempted, the one that lived this human experience. The one who was God made flesh, who took on skin and bones, who took on ears and earlobes. Come on. The one who came and walked on the earth. Guess what? He was crucified. He was resurrected. And he's in heaven. And guess what he's doing? He's been praying for 2,000 years. He's been interceding for you and for me for 2,000 years. So let's go to him and let's learn how to pray. I love this scripture. He is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. Now he can hear your prayers. See, he lives, I love this, he lives forever to make intercession for us. Jesus' primary role right now, because he's already finished the work on the cross, you know what his role is right now? Representing us to the Father. Pleading the blood before the Father. He's just going, here I am, Lord. They're calling out. They're calling out to me. Guess what? Here I am. The enemy's accusing. He's going, I plead the blood. Remember? Remember what I did? He's before the Father. Continue. He lives. He longs to make intercession for you. Forever. The right hand of God making intercession. As Romans 8 says. 
So we have full access through Jesus. So because of that, we know Hebrews tells us this, that let us approach the throne of grace, the throne of grace, boldly, boldly. boldly. We can boldly approach we God. Boldly we approach God. God. You were a sinner. Before you couldn't because you were a sinner. And some of you here, you're, and some of you here, you're, you're hesitant to approach God. Boldly. You're hesitant. You're you hesitant God because maybe you, you have sin in your life. Maybe you have sin in your life. Or maybe you have shame. Or maybe you have shame in your life. Which I think for the believers, it's far more damaging. It's far more damaging. Because its effects last longer. Sin the effects last longer. Just the Lord, we know the Lord. But if we get stuck on shame, the enemy. But if we get stuck on shame, the enemy. What we do is we just say, you know what? What we do is we say, you know what? Throne of grace, boldness, grace, and confidence. I can come over grace with courage and with confidence, courage and with confidence. Because of what? Why? Because of what Jesus. And I can approach Him. And I can approach Him. We can receive that we can receive grace. When we need it most. So what do you do when you need when you need grace? Do you, need, do you get mad at us? It's not going to help you. It's just going to make your heart bitter. It's not going to heal anything. It's just kind of wasted time. And so the Lord wants to do is He wants you to come to Him and point to the blood. Lord, I'm here not because I have a great track record, but I plead the blood. I plead the blood for the great intercessor. And then he says this, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed, not hallowed, <laughs> right? It's not hollow, <laughs> right? Hallowed be your name. That's a strange word, right? It's not a word we use every day. It's, it's probably better that way. Because the word hallowed is actually comes from the word holy, right? Hagios is the Greek word, which is holy, Hagiozo, something like that, means to render or treat as sacred. So what he's saying, he's not just going, he's not just going, God is holy. He's saying, I'm setting apart your name as holy. This is why I'm way more offended when somebody says the name of Jesus or the name of God, way more offended by that because they're not treating his name as sacred. And I see Christians do it all the time, by the way. Not honoring that we honor up, honoring the name of the Lord. Listen, that name is sacred. Hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. Your name is precious. Your name is sacred. How dare I use that word for any other purpose than to bring than to address you? And we people do this with their prayers. Lord, 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 Lord. Father, 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 Father. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's like, whoa. Can we back up a second? Can we think about what we're saying? We are declaring that name that is above every name. We are declaring that uncommon, precious name of Jesus. Do not make God's name common. It is uncommon. It is a holy name. So if he's holy, how do we approach him? We do it with reverence. Ooh. What is reverence? Re reverence could be looked at this way. Joyful fear. Joyful fear. You're not afraid, but you're kind of like, hey. <laughs> it's like we're wrestling a lion. Like we're wrestling a lion. This is what I, I like to think of whenever we think about joyful fear. Wrestling a lion. And we know that lions can get like up to like 10 feet long. We know that they can get up to like 550 pounds. We, we, we know that they can, they can bite up to like 650 pounds per square inch. A lion can crush you, can take you out in a moment. Just a little bit more than thinking about it. A lion could crush you. However, the Lord who is wild, love C.S. Lewis on this. He is a lion. He's wild, right? He's not tame, but he wants to wrestle. He wants to play. But don't forget he's a lion. Don't forget he's a lion. Don't get too comfortable when wrestling with God because he can take you out. Don't start making your demands. We don't make demands before God. We're not in charge of God. He's in charge of us. He's not your pet kitten. He's not a caged lion. He's not your bro. When people pray, hey, bro, I'm like, no, uh-uh. You're forgetting. My kids don't call me bro. Hey, bro, I don't think so. I'm not your bro. I'm your dad, first of all. Right? Why? Because 
don't forget who I am. And sometimes, sometimes daddy just needs to say, daddy's home. Sometimes mama needs to say, mama's home. Other words, don't forget. I will cuddle you and I will be on your bed and we will hang out and we will play, but I can also take you out just like that. And that's what reverence is, is we don't forget his power. We don't forget. We don't, listen, we never, we never get caught up in, in our accessibility to where we forget how awesome he is. And I think so many times when we come into worship, we, we, start, we start singing songs and we're just mouthing and there's no heart connect and we forget to reverence God. Listen, beloved, he is all powerful. He, is, he will not be tamed. He says, come on, let's do this. But don't forget who he is. He's holy. Hopefully you don't talk to your boss like you talk to your coworkers. We honor up. It's a posture of, of reverent worship. That word worship, and some of us don't like this, that word worship is actually the picture of a dog kissing his master's hand or licking a master's hand. That's what the word worship actually means. It's a picture of a, of a dog licking his master. It's not saying that you're dogs. It's just saying that you are just, you're not on that level. You are not on God's level. He came to yours. And it made you right, but you're not divine. So it's really about this posture of humility. That's what reverence is. It's a posture of humility. So we, what do we do? We, we say, God, that's who you are. So I, I'm learning this thing called bowing. Okay, strange. I know. Bear with me, Americans. <laughs> right? So when you bow, and I heard this on, on a podcast uh, not too long ago, and the, the guy was talking about when he prays, sometimes he just he gets down, and he puts his head to the ground, and when he puts his head to the ground, what he's doing is he's getting his heart above his head. And I thought, oh. And so when we bow, really this bowing is saying, is an act of surrender saying, if you want to take my head off, you can. But for the believer, we go a little bit further. We put our head to the ground, and we say, not only can you take my head, you can take my heart. You can take my affections. You can take my desires. You can take it all. So I'm just, I'm bowing down saying, Lord, it's not about my will. It's about yours be done. And so I'm just yielding myself to the Lord. I'm yielding myself. I'm yielding myself. That place of surrender, that place of, of humility. So the prayer tip is this. What do you do? So what I do, the, 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 the best way in worship, the best thing that we can do is we can just sing. To the Lord. Sing and worship the Lord when you pray. So when you're there, when I'm sitting there, I'm just like, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To, I don't sing to you. That would be weird. I might sing to my wife from time to time. Come on. But that's reserved for the Lord. And in that moment, I'm just, I'm just yielding myself to the Lord. I'm directing. I'm showing affection. I'm showing desire. So that's why we have the furnace, right? That's why we get together and pray on Saturday nights because prayer and worship work together because worship is a sign of saying, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. I'm honoring your name. Your name is worthy. That word, that name that he gives us, y'all okay? That word that he gives us in the old covenant, he, he showed up as Elohim, Right? We talked about this last year during the covenant series. He says this, he shows up as Elohim, which is a plural name for God, and then he gives Adam and Eve a name that they start calling him. The, the word is Lord, and in the, in the Hebrew language, the word is Yahweh. And God gave us this name, Yahweh. Why? So God had a name to sign the contract with. So that we didn't just refer to him as the heavenly father, but he says, I want to be one who is in covenant with you. And so God gave us a name that could be signed on the contract, and that name is Yahweh. And some people say Jehovah. Jehovah is like the English translation, but the Greek word is Yahweh. It's actually like a breath word, Yahweh. And so there's this, this list of compound words in his name that we have. We have, we have the name the, the Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And if we've got these in your notes so you can take home. And when you pray, go through that list and just start saying, you need provisions in your life? The Lord, Jehovah, you are Je Jehovah Jireh. You are Yahweh Jireh, the Lord will provide. You got sickness in your body? Lord, you are Jehovah Rapha, which is a little bit misspelled there. It's Rapha. The Lord who heals. You are Jehovah Nisi. That means the Lord is my banner or my victory. You are Jehovah Kadesh. You are Yahweh Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies, the one who makes holy. You are God Shalom. 
Lord Shalom, Yahweh Shalom, the Lord our peace. You are Lord Sitkanu, which is the Lord my righteousness. I'm, I'm, I'm screwed up this week, but my righteousness is in you. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are Jehovah Sitkanu. You are Jehovah Rahi. You are the Lord our shepherd. You lead me. Lord, I need leadership. You, you are Yahweh Rahi. Lead me, Lord like a shepherd. You are Yahweh Shema. That means the Lord is there. Lord, I'm not feeling you right now. Lord, you are Lord. You are Shema. Yahweh Shema. You are Lord Sabbath, which is the Lord of hosts, which basically means he's going to fight your battles. And so you could just get these names and you just get it right there. Stick that note sheet in your Bible. And when you're praying, just start calling out the name of the Lord. And then you could call out the name that is above every name. That name that means Yahweh saves. The name is Jesus. And that's what Jesus means. When we call on the name of the Lord, we're saying, Yahweh saves. Yeshua. Yahweh saves. It's the name above every name. See, all that we need all that we need is in God's nature. It's in his identity. It's in his name. All that you need, all that you need, beloved, in your life, it's in God's identity. It's in his reality. This is why we want to encounter the reality of Jesus because all that I need, all the peace I need, all the joy I need, all the, all the money I need, come on, whatever, all the, all the healing I need, all of it is in the name of Jesus. All the righteousness that I need, it's in Jesus. All of it. And so what I want you to do is in this prayer tip here is when you are praying, and just take these prayer tips when you're praying, it'll help you emphasize that his name is holy. Emphasize his name is holy. Just get before the Lord. Hello, Father, I thank you that I have access by Jesus. And I just recognize your holy name. I'm just worshiping you. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Just have a worship service. Right there in, your, in that place that you've designated to pray. That great name, Jesus. The name, Philippians says, that is above every name. It's above every power. It's above every authority. Listen, you have full access. Full access. Full access. Full access. Full access. Full access. You don't need a priest. Come on, you know that, that curtain was torn. You don't need a priest. You don't need a preacher. Come on, you don't need a, you don't need a parent. You just need the Lord who went before. You might need one of those per persons to point you to the Lord. He is Yeshua. He is the Lord who saves. The Lord who provides. So when we pray, I'm closing with this, and then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna practice this for a moment. When we pray, Three ways. These are kind of the three takeaways today. I know there's a lot. Listen, number one, it's crazy how so much is in that one verse, huh? We pray regularly. Regularly. Right? Fre that means frequently and faithfully. You might not do it seven days a week. You probably won't. But if you do it three or four, you're doing pretty good. Oh, man, it's just so hard for me to, to get up early in the morning. Then do it late at night. Whenever it is, put it in your calendar. There's an appointment. God has an appointment with you. Don't miss the appointment. But what's awesome about the appointment is he lets you select the time. I like it in the morning. Jesus did it in the morning. I like it in the morning because my brain hasn't been mushed up. Right? The chalkboard is clean. Right? It's like, okay, let's go. Regular. Secret place, the hidden place. Just get in there. Secondly, is this is relationally. Just like that prayer point that we talked about. We talk to God, our Father. He's our Father. He's our Father. Put a spirit in our hearts to where we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. I'm just coming to come in again, Lord. Father, I'm here. Here I am because of what Jesus did. Just talking to you, Lord, because you're here, you're present. I struggled yesterday, Lord, you know. I'm just here to talk because I need some help, and I'm approaching you confidently, courageously. And the third is this, just reverently, that you're saying, and let me just suggest this to you. The fact that you are praying is a symbol of reverence because you're saying someone is more powerful than I am. 
but you don't take it lightly. Worshiping and adoring his name frequently and faithfully, regularly. Every day, that's the plan, every day. Right? If I went, if I went this week, if Leslie and I were here at church, hey, how you doing? Love you, baby. You look good today. Mm-hmm. And then we don't see each other till next Sunday. We don't talk. We don't text. We don't have a relationship. We might be religiously devoted to seeing one another one day a week, but we don't have a relationship. So regularly, relationally, regularly, relationally, he's our father. He's our father. He's not just the father. He's our father. Because of the blood of Jesus, we get to talk to God. We get to approach God. My wickedness no longer hinders me. I get to approach Him. Reverently. Lord, you're so kind. Can we just practice that right now? Can you just stand up? Lord, you're just so good. Well, let's just, let's just run this through real quick. Our Father. Come on, I, I, I want you to use some words. You don't have to be loud. It's just a little mutter. I want you to think about the Father. I'm helping you develop your prayer life right now. We're practicing for what you're going to do tomorrow morning. Father. Oh, Father, you know all. You see all. You see all, our Father. You hold all power. You are the great one. You're completely uncommon. You're other than. You're amazing. There's none like you. And Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Lord, that we can approach that throne of grace and receive, apprehend mercy when we need it most. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we have full access, Father, by the blood of Jesus, the great intercessor. Lord, we thank you that you are Jehovah Nisi, that you are our banner, that you are our victory. Come on, we're just learning right now how to pray. Come on. Some of you need victory right now. I'm just going to ask the ministry team to come up. Some of you, they, 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 you need victory in your life. You need breakthrough. They'll be up here to pray for you right now. Come on, some of you need healing. You are Jehovah Rapha, Lord. Father. Jesus. Yahweh Rapha, you are the healer. You are Yeshua, Hamashiach. You are Yeshua, Hamashiach. You are the one who saves. You are the one who rescues. Come on, just worship his name reverently. Come on, approach him. Whatever need you have in your life, just approach him right now. Thank you so much for joining us at church today. Please subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for future notifications. We pray that you have a blessed week and we can't wait to encounter Jesus with you online.